In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus and Mary, we consecrate this time to you. We place ourselves in your hearts. We place our minds, our wills, our emotions, all that we're going through right now, all the busyness of our lives. And we ask for the grace to enter into this time of great joy when we kind of are contemplating the, all of the consecration, why we are here and why um, what God has been doing in our lives these last 33 days. These last 33 days, we have used the spiritual wisdom of four giants of Marian spirituality. These 33 days were given to us to prepare ourselves to grow in knowledge and love and commitment. It has been a time of abandonment and growing in trust of God. Each day we contemplated God, Mary, and ourselves in the Father's plan of salvation. It was important as we did this to take time to pray, ponder, and respond to the great mysteries of God with, in, and through Mary's help and guidance. To the extent that we did this, and we continue to do so, we will grow in faith and holiness as we cast off our sins and attachments. We will become ever more free and more fully alive as the person whom God created us to be. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. That is why we have entered into this Marian consecration. Marian consecration means giving Mary permission to complete her motherly role in our spiritual lives of helping us to be to great holiness in her son Jesus. It means saying to Mary, Mary, I want to be a saint. I know that you also want me to be a saint and that it's your God-given mission to form me into one. So Mary, at this moment, on this day, I freely choose to give you my full permission to do your work in me with your spouse, the Holy Spirit. We go to Mary because she is such a gentle mother. mother. She makes the lessons of the cross into something sweet. She pours her motherly love and solace into every wound. And going to her is the surest, easiest, shortest, and most perfect means to becoming a saint. Total consecration is not an optional devotion, but a way of life. It is a surefire way to holiness. It is the quickest, easiest, surest, most perfect way to be transformed. Is surrendering and opening of ourselves to God with and through the help of Mary our mother so that God can come inside us and free us and live and move and have his being in us Mary prays for us and carries us to him when we can't reach him by ourselves John Paul II said that he did not consider Mary in consecration to be a, a peripheral devotion or an optional one he said rather that it was so essential to Catholic spirituality that this quote, this perfect devotion is indispensable to anyone who means to give himself without reserve to Christ and to the work of redemption. So this consecration is indip indispensable for growing in the holiness that God wants us to have. Mary is the supreme example of a human being transformed by God and so fully open to him that the Son of God was born in, through, with, and of her. Looking at Mary and what God accomplished in her sheds light on the greatness of God and his glory. It engenders love and knowledge of him, for we as humans recognize him who is beyond all knowing through pondering what he has done. It gives faith and hope for what God accomplished in Mary to the supreme degree he longs to do in and through each of us. 
that is from St. Louis de Montfort. And that's why St. Louis says that we can never, um, and all the great Marian saints, St. Maximilian Kolbe, um, I think John Paul as well, said that we can never fully um, express the greatness of Mary and all the attributes God gave her and all the graces that were poured out upon her. And um, because everything she was given she was given everything by god and we can never praise her or thank her enough or put her too high because however high we put her the highest possibly we could put her only means that god who is her creator and gave her all of this goodness and greatness is infinitely higher and greater than what we could ever imagine so again, like uh, Maximilian Kolbe has said to us, we can never love Mary enough. We can never love her like Jesus or the Father or the Spirit has loved her before, like they have before us. If then we are establishing sound devotion to our Blessed Mother, our Blessed Lady is only in order to establish devotion to our Lord more perfectly by providing a smooth but certain way of reaching Jesus Christ. It is a way of reaching Jesus perfectly, loving him tenderly, and serving him faithfully. It is Jesus whom we seek when we dream of happiness. He is waiting for us when nothing else we find satisfies us. He is the beauty to which we are so attracted. It is he who provokes us with that thirst for fullness that will not let us settle for compromise. It is he who urges us to shed the masks of a false life. It is he who reads in your heart your most genuine choices, the choices that others try to stifle. It is Jesus who stirs in you the desire to do something great with your lives, the will to follow an ideal, the refusal to allow ourselves to be ground down by medio mediocrity, the courage to commit ourselves humbly and patiently to improving ourselves in society, making the world more human and more fraternal. John Paul II um, always tells us, it is Jesus whom we seek when we dream of happiness. He is the fulfillment of all our longing. That is why we're entering into this time during Advent. In Advent, there are two births of Christ, one unto the world in Bethlehem and the other into the soul. We think of the former much more than the latter and celebrate it every year. But the personal relationship of the individual heart to Christ is equally momentous. That is what we're striving to do in this consecration. And especially in this time, I have felt impelled, compelled to share this with each of you, to share it with the whole world, and to renew it again myself, because we are living in grave evil times. Uh, I've spoken about this before. Again, um, we look to St. Louis um, de Montfort about these times. This era of Mary is the era of the Antichrist. For Montfort, um, this is by um, Father Livio. He says, um, for de Montfort, the era of Mary and the era of the Antichrist are one and the same thing because Mary appears on the battlefield precisely in order to vanquish the Antichrist forces, which are the forces of evil that operate throughout history and against the apostles. The apostles chosen by Mary whom she forms. Montfort calls these the apostles of the last times. This is why I think it's so important she has um, appeared on the battlefield through the grace and love of God in these times that Satan is so active and so strong. In this uh, time when he knows his time is about to end, God has allowed her to come again and again to bring his children back to himself. 
St. John Paul II said, We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical conf confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think that the wide circle of the American society or the whole wide circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. The confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the church must take up and face courageously. He further, he continues, on this universal level, if victory comes, it will be brought by Mary. Christ will conquer through her because he wants the church's victories now and in the future to be linked to her. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about um, public revelation and private revelation, just to, to touch on it. Public revelation is the truth that has been dis disclosed by Jesus and his apostles and his, the prophets before them. It ended with the death of the last apostle. Divine public revelation is closed. There will be no more new revelation, but the church will ever develop what has already been revealed. Private revelation is the word used by the church to describe Truths unveiled since the death of the last apostle. According to Pope Benedict XVI, apparitions or private revelation is an aid to living the gospel at a particular time. Fatima is a private revelation. In the message of Fatima, the Vatican said, it is certainly the most prophetic of modern private revelations. This important distinction is made by Pope Benedict XVI along with the Catechism of the Catholic Church, binding private revelation to a particular time in history. St. John Paul said, Fatima is ever relevant. He said it is still more relevant than it was 65 years ago. It is still urgent. So how is it so urgent and how is it so relevant? Have we listened to the messages of Our Lady? Have we um, entered into these con this consecration of her Immaculate Heart? Do we um, pray the first Saturdays as she's asked? Do we, um, have we repented and offered ourselves to her for the conversion of sinners? Have we prayed the rosary daily? As she asked. Sister Lucia, the, again, the oldest uh, visionary of Fatima, says now it is necessary for each one of us to begin to reform himself spiritually. Each person must not only save his own soul, but also help all the souls that God has placed on our path. The devil does all in his power to distract us and to take away from us the love for prayer. We shall be saved together or we shall be damned together. And I wanted to share um, Father Gately's thoughts about how Divine Mercy and Fatima go together in this age. He, he speaks of St. John Paul saying, that evil has a reach and a power in our day like never before. His, uh, our time is marked by unprecedented evil. However, as Saint, or as the Apostle Paul said in the Romans, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Grace, God will not abandon us, nor be overcome by evil. This is why Saint John Paul II would constantly say, be not afraid. That is why we're entering into this consecration, this entrustment. We're growing in trust so we cannot be afraid no matter what happens on the outside, no matter what happens in our world, no matter what happens, no matter how dark it seems to be. This consecration helps us grow in trust and stay close to God 
and filled with trust in him. I'll go back to Father Gately now. Never, nonetheless, before we can receive mercy, we must repent. God will not force himself on us. We have to approach him with contrite hearts for the torrents of divine mercy to reach us. We must repent. Thus we see how the message of messages of Fatima and all the Marian apparitions um, tie in with divine mercy. They supplement and complement each other. The ever-relevant call to repentance of Fatima prepares and harmonizes with divine mercy. Repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and mercy. This is a divine mercy that is given to us in this time. is an extraordinary time of grace. It's not, Father Gately said, not the ordinary mercy of God but the overwhelming abundance of divine mercy as a response by God to this time of great evil to people, again, this is me talking, inserting myself, a time where Satan has blinded so many souls and so many souls are really lost in sin and darkness and don't even believe in God anymore. So, as Father Gately says, again, we can hear today the call to repentance in Fatima, which anticipates and supports the divine mercy, ever relevant, ever deeply rooted in the gospel. Our Lady said to St. Dominic, and then she says it over and over in every single apparition, I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to all those who shall recite the rosary. Pope Benedict the the sixteenth also said that Fatima's um, mission is it would be a mistake to believe it is complete. He says here there takes a new life the plan of God which asks humanity from the beginning, where is your brother? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Mankind has succeeded in unleashing a cycle of death and terror, but failed in bringing it to an end. In sacred scripture, we often find that God seeks righteous men and women in order to save the city of man, and he does the same here in Fatima, when Our Lady asks, Do you want to offer yourselves to God, to endure all the sufferings which he, which he will send you, in an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended, and of supplication for the conversion of sinners. We are called to be co-redeemers. We are called to give ourselves completely and offer ourselves to God for the salvation of the world and for the salvation of ourselves. John Paul II, again, he was totally committed to total consecration. He gave himself completely to Mary, and he entered into this, and it became um, the impetus for his whole life and the foundation for all of his great um, graces and all that he was able to accomplish was because he was filled with the divine life of God in and through um, his consecration to Mary. Mary only and always brings us deeper into God's love, deeper into his will, um, surrendering ourselves so that God can fully take over. Despite um, John Paul endorsing Mary in consecration, for many people, it's difficult to understand. Even John Paul admitted that he needed to reread True Devotion to Mary several times in order to understand it. And I've shared that with people before. When I first read True Devotion to Mary, it, I struggled. I, I really struggled with the way things were said, and I really had to wrestle with it. And I am so glad. That's why I always, I try to always um, offer 
um, to true devotion to Mary along with the 33 days because I think um, St. Louis's um, wisdom is, is very deep and very hard to understand and it will only draw us closer if we wrestle with it. It'll make us um, um, deeper and more committed to this consecration than we ever could be if we didn't have it. This is from um, Jason Everett's book, St. John Paul the Great, His Five Loves. He's quoting John Paul saying, I found the answer to my perplexities due to the fear that the devotion to Mary, if excessive, might end up compromising the supremacy of the worship owed to Christ. Under the wise guidance of St. Louis Marie, I understood that if one lives the mystery of Mary in Christ, such a risk does not exist. If we are truly living the mystery of Mary in Christ, we have nothing to fear. If our aim and our goal is always Christ, we have nothing to fear. And so he um, he made Totus to us his papal mo motto, and he wanted it to be a part of St. Peter's Square. There was no image of Mary or Marian consecration in St. Peter's Square, so he had this mosaic um, um, made for the square. And it says um, Mater Ecclesia, which means Mother of the Church. And then after he um, we shot, and um, almost died from the assassin's attempt. I've shared this before. He felt compelled to um, to go back to Fatima to read the messages, to read the secrets, and to consecrate the world. And I just found this story today about the importance of consecration and that how it saved the whole world from nuclear war. So I'm going to um, share this the story that I just read today, it's really amazing and fascinating. It starts off with on September 1st in 1983, flying from Anchorage to Seoul, a Korean airline. I, I don't know if some of you remember this, but it flew into Russian airspace accidentally and all um, 269 people were killed when a Russian um, fighter jet shot down the plane. This outrageous action prompted all the Western European countries, including Great Britain and Germany, to okay accepting the United States medium range missiles beginning in November of that year. With their military advantage rapidly shrinking, the Soviets were readying for war. Then 205 days later, on March 25th, 1984, St. John Paul II consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He invited all the bishops in the world to join him for this ceremony, closing the Holy Year of Redemption. He did the consecration at St. Peter's in Rome as he knelt before the statue of Our Lady of Fatima, brought there from Fatima. Less than two months later, in 1984, on May 13th, the 67th anniversary of the first apparition of Fatima, catastrophe hit the Russian fleet at the naval base located near Finland on the Barents Sea. A fire believed caused by a cigarette turned catastrophic like a spark in a huge fireworks factory. It triggered the explosion of a huge stockpile of missiles. Of 900 anti-aircraft missiles, 580 were destroyed. Of 400 surface-to-surface -surface missiles able to carry nuclear warheads, 320 of them were obliterated. Upwards of 300 military personnel died. It devastated the Soviet Union's northern fleet. I had no idea that this happened. The story continues, and I'll link the um, um, the article in in my uh, notes. 
Years later, Sister Lucia wrote, Everyone knows perfectly well that we went through one of the most critical moments in human history when the great mutually hostile powers planned a nuclear war that would have destroyed the world, if not the whole world. If not the whole world, then the greater part of it. And what would have remained? What chances of survival? And who could have dissuaded these arrogant people surrounded by their war plans? Who, if not God? Authors record this in Fatima Mysteries. The following year, in 1985, during an apparition in her convent, Sister Lucia revealed that Our Lady told her, if that consecration had not been made by John Paul II, there would have been a nuclear war. Because of the consecration, this didn't happen. There was an undeniable link between it and the major destruction of weapons of the Soviet's northern fleet. Sister Lucia told this to the cardinals of India and the Philippines when they visited her in the convent. Isn't that extraordinary? And it goes on. So there was a preview in 1983. A year earlier, there was also a major near miss of nuclear war between Russia and the United States. Surely Our Lady of Fatima must have had a hand in preventing this horrendous possibility in 1983 because the year before, on May 13, 1982 in Fatima, John Paul II made the act of an entrustment of the world, but he didn't completely fulfill the request of Our Lady because it wasn't done in union with all the bishops of the world. He intended to do it at that do it that way, but the letters informing the bishops were sent too late. The result they were unable to join him that time. This event appeared to reflect what happened in 1942 during World War II. On October 31st, Pope Pius XII consecrated the world in Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But the consecration wasn't done in union with all the bishops of the world. It was a critical time in the war as the enemy was making major advances. Sister Lucia would say our Lord showed his delight even though the consecration was incomplete and promised to end to the war soon, shortly after the tide turned as the Allies began to win key battles. So just as though that consecration, though imperfect, it helped end World War II, similarly, John Paul's 1982 entrustment, even without all the bishops of the world, must have had the same effect when we would consider what could have happened during that 1983 event to follow. Back to 1983, as God used Cyrus to help the Israelites, as Isaiah recounted, could it not be possible Our Lady also averted a nuclear war using a single officer in the Soviet Air Defense Forces? His name, Stanislav Petrov. In the early morning hours on September 26, 1983, Petrov was at his post in a secret command center outside Moscow. As the duty officer, the 44-year-old lieutenant colonel had a job of watching the computer that monitored the Soviet's early warning system, linked to satellites all over the United States on the lookout for nuclear launches. It was 25 days after the Soviets shot down the Korean passenger plane. Earlier, President Ronald Reagan had condemned the Soviets as an evil empire, and short-range missiles were placed in Europe. The Cold War was at a boiling point. Everyone was on the edge of the seat, uh, edge of their seat alert. Petrov was at his post, unexpected unexpectedly less than an hour after midnight the alarm sounded the siren howled but i just sat there for years for a few seconds staring at the big black lit backlit red screen with the word launch on it he would tell an interviewer years later the system insisted the alert was reliable and the united states had launched a missile a minute later the siren went, went off again 
a sec the second missile was launched, then the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Computers changed their alerts from launch to missile strike. The system was calling for the Soviet protocol, retaliate. There is no rule about how long we were allowed to think before we reported a strike, but we knew that every second of procrastination took away valuable time that the Soviet Union's military and political leadership needed to be informed without delay. All I had to do was to reach for the phone, to raise the direct line to our top commanders, but I couldn't move. I felt like I was sitting on a frying pan. All the data was telling him there was a nuclear missile attack on the way. In less than 30 minutes, the missiles would reach their target. Petrov's role was the critical middleman. But he was frozen. He couldn't do anything. Something. Could it have been someone held him back from reaching for that phone immediately? Instead, his delayed response um, saved the whole world from a nuclear war. I had a funny feeling in my gut, he would say, as his delay stretched out. The Soviet ground radar systems reported they were not picking up anything. Despite the report, the protocol response from him was to be based on the computer information. He knew the early warning computer system was new and had some misgivings about it. Once the missiles were detected, the information had to go through up to 29 security levels, and Petrov wasn't certain that was possible so quickly. Still not fully sure whether the a computer alarm information was correct or wrong, he made an agonizing decision. He reached for the phone and reported the early warning system malfunctioned. A false alarm. 23 minutes later, I realized that nothing had happened. If there had been a real strike, then I would have known about it. It was such a relief. All the other officers that could have been there at that time were trained professional soldiers who would have immediately followed instructions and protocol to the letter. Why was he a civilian education um, person? Why was he the only one there at that critical moment? Was it heaven? Was it heaven? Was it has heaven's choice? <laughs> He later would say to uh, in an interview with Christian Science Monitor, I wish I could say there was no chance of an accidental nuclear launch today, but when we deal with space, we play God. Who knows what will be the next surprise? So <laughs> that's amazing that he said that as a uh, Soviets are all atheists. Um, remember, we talked about... The Soviet um, Union was uh, uh, founded on atheism and um, strict athe atheism and communism, which um, Mary has come to save us from. So again, I, I show this image of the nuclear test uh, that shows Mary in the in the cloud and a picture of uh, Jesus on the cross right here and Mary is right here showing that God is more more powerful than anything man can do the rosary shall be a powerful army against hell it will destroy heresies destroy vice decrease sin and destroy heresies it will cause good works to flourish it will obtain for souls the abundant mercy of God it will withdraw the hearts of men from the love of the world and its vanities and will lift them to the desire of earthly things. We have a par powerful army in, go in God and in Mary. And remember, in the end, uh, Mary has promised that her immaculate heart will triumph. She promised it in Fatima and she promises it again in Mejigoria. One of the visionaries in Medjugorje says, I cannot divulge, divulge much about the secrets, but I can say this, Our Lady is coming to change the world. She did not come to announce our destruction. 
She came to save us, and with her son she will triumph over evil. There's, I, I can share some links with you about Magigoria, but I did want to say um, just a few things. The Cardinal, um, a prelate of Croatia, Kaharic, only two years after the apparitions began in 1983, reflected, How can I doubt that Magigoria is God's doing? Do you know that half a million young people have surrendered to Christ? The Lord is stirring this country. They need 50 to 60 priests every weekend just to hear confessions and to counsel these young people. And it's because of this apparition. And that was just two years after the apparitions began. Now it is estimated that over 50 million people have gone at least. And 50 to 60 priests are needed daily almost for the confessions that are needed to be heard. John Paul too has many, many wonderful things to say. And I, um, I can share a link of his words on Medjugorje. One of them is that today's world has lost its sense of the supernatural, but many are searching for it and find it in Medjugorje through prayer, penance, and fasting. He saw that Medjugorje um, had a supernatural gift of consecration and of confession and of healing. Most, um, while there are many, many physical healings and amazing manifestations like the sun dancing as it danced in Fatima, most of the conversions, most of the miracles are conversion stories. And that's what God really cares about. He wants us to be converted. That's what makes um, him most happy. That's what really matters. John Paul II gave um, Father Yozo, the parish priest of Medjugorje, um, a particular blessing, invoked a new outpouring of graces and heavenly favors and continuous protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He also told him to take good care of Medjugorje. Father Yozo would prophesy about this place that John Paul II was convinced that was an answer to his prayers that occurred in communist, um, a communist country. He said these words, Here in Medjugorje ends a great war which in Europe began with the arrival of communism. Here the prophecy of Fatima with respect to the conversion of the world and the debacle of the atheistic communist regime is justified, is carried out, and here where communism and evil were perhaps the most deeply rooted, here where the Virgin Mary appeared, here is taking place what is going to be a unique, grandiose, the victory, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the downfall of human errors, the change of the human heart, the creation of a new mentality, the beginning of a better world, the triumph that Mary first tells us about is going to be glorious. That is the end quote. Um, except for my, um, my words at the very end. Jesus will reign in all hearts. The historical mission of the Virgin Mary is bringing Jesus into the world. From Jesus, she receives all things and all her strength. And with this strength and the love that they share, she leads everyone who permits her to Jesus. To everything she does, Jesus is the measure as well as the means. Therefore, the Virgin Mary's heart cannot be said to have triumphed until every human heart is resting in the love and peace of Jesus. This is why her expressed goal of the apparitions in Medjugorje is no less than the conversion of the world and why she has specifically linked her coming triumph to the presence of Jesus in all hearts. This is what we are praying for. This is what we're hoping for and longing for, the triumph of Jesus and Mary in all hearts. Our Lady told um, Father Stefano Gobi in um, apparitions that he, she gave to him, the powers of hell will not prevail, even if now they have reached the point 
of contesting the Pope and of opposing him openly and of rejecting his magisterium. Thus, errors are being spread about which draw many away from the true faith, and sects are being propagated which draw to themselves many children of the church. But I am calling all my children to the greatest fidelity to the Catholic Church. I am instilling in them a love for the church, zeal for her unity, passion for her holiness, and strength for her work of evangelization. And thus, through those who are consecrating themselves to my Immaculate Heart, I am bringing to nothing all the effort which Satan is exerting in his attempt to draw many of my children away from the one and only church established by my son Jesus. And by means of my extraordinary and motherly intervention, once again the powers of hell will not prevail. That was a message given February 22nd, 1996. The devil knows this, which is why he uses others, especially self-important intellectuals who are puffed up with pride to attack Fatima or Marian apparitions and messages in general, or to attempt to undermine their prophetic significance. Mary comes, and we have to be humble to accept her. We have to be humble to listen to her messages and put them into practice. And um, priests that come from Medjugorje, this is one of their um, attestations for why they believe it is authentic and of God. Because they said that people who have gone to Medjugorje are the ones that are most faithful to the church. They're most steadfast. They're the ones that um, do the most to um, live and live out their faith. And they are the ones that, although they are heartbroken at the sin that is found in the church, they will never um, neglect the church or turn away from it. They're steadfast. Mary makes us steadfast. Mary is the means. Jesus Christ is the only end. There's a, the author, God, establishes a relationship between two different but closely related events. The first constituted by the incarnation of the word in the nativity. The second surrounded by mystery because as yet unrealized is the kingdom of God in the world. It is a kingdom in history that as it will appear clearly from the development of the treatise of True devotion should not be understood as parousia, but as the triumph of his mystical body, the church. This will be the result of the marvels produced once again after the incarnation by the union between the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. The reign is defined by the, um, as the reign of Mary. The reign, especially attributed to God the Father, lasted until the flood, writes St. Louis de Montfort, and ended in a deluge of water. The reign of Jesus Christ ended in a deluge of blood, but your reign, Spirit of the Father and the Son, is still unended and will come to a close with a deluge of fire, love, and justice. St. Louis, a prophet who announces the coming of the reign of Mary, asking the Lord for a flood of fire of pure love that will purify mankind and that will burn gently yet so forcefully that all nation, nations, Muslims, idolaters, Jews, all will be caught up in its flames and be converted. When will this fortunate time come when God's mother is enthroned in men's hearts as queen, subjecting them to the dominion of her great and princely son? That day, writes Louis de Montfort, will dawn only when the devotion I teach is understood and put into practice. Lord, 
that your kingdom may come, may the reign of Mary come. St. Louis de Montfort affirms that the reign of Mary will be a time of flourishing of the church such as never has been known in history. He states that to establish this period, the Almighty God and His Holy Mother are to raise up great saints who, who will surpass in holiness most other saints as much as the cedars of Lebanon tower above little shrubs. The way in which the special union of Mary with the souls of her apostles will be realized will be, in practice be the true devotion of which he reveals and deepens the secret. The royalty of Our Lady must be achieved in the first place inside souls. From here it will reflect on the religious and civil life of the people as a whole. The reign of Mary will therefore be a time when the union of souls with Our Lady will reach an intensity that is unprecedented in history, except obviously for individual cases. What form does this, in a certain sense, supreme union have? I do not know a more perfect means of expressing and achieving this union than the holy slavery to Our Lady, as taught by St. Louis Marie um, de Montfort in the treatise on the true devotion to Mary. That is uh, a quote by Polinio Correa de Oliveira, speaking of the reign of Mary, speaking of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. This is why we are consecrating ourselves to bring about this glorious, amazing reign, this reign of the Holy Spirit, this reign of God in the hearts and minds of all to the extent that we enter into it is the extent that we will live it ourselves and help bring it about to others if one were to ask saint john paul why his pontificate was so fruitful he would have had unhesitant Hesitatingly affirmed that it was due to the entrustment of his papacy to the Virgin Mary. This is from Jason Everett's book, the Saint John Paul the Great. Through her maternal mediation, God chose to do marvelous things. In countless ways, she reciprocated John Paul's gift of self by giving herself to him. A providential foreshadowing of this happened in Poland before he was elected Pope. During the celebration of the coronation of a statue of Our Lady, the scepter fell out of Mary's hands and was caught by Cardinal Wojtyla. A priest standing beside him said, Carol, Mary shares her power with you. Years later, affirming what I have already shared in this talk and before, John Paul said, Again, the victory, if it comes, will come through Mary. Christ will conquer through her because he wants the church's vic victories now and in the future to be linked to her. And I wanted to end with a, a poem, a prayer, actually, that he wrote entitled Totus Tuus. Immaculate Conception, Mary, my mother, live in me, act in me, Speak in me and through me. Think your thoughts in my mind. Love through my heart. Give me your dispositions and feelings. Teach, lead me, and guide me to Jesus. Correct, enlighten, and expand my thoughts and behaviors. Possess my soul. Take over my entire personality in life. Replace it with yourself. Incline me to constant adoration. Pray in me and through me. Let me live in you and keep me in this union always. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.